is Alex Machczek and you're watching the Guitar Mania channel. Crush your enemies. See them driven before you. Great to have you in Austria. My pleasure. Welcome to Vienna, back again. And we decided, uh, two Austrians, but we still decided to talk English today. Because we're so international. <laughs> That's right. Talking about international, uh, we just heard your soundtrack and you're using a lot of sample. Herbert the Pervert, uh, my drummer, decided he wants to hip, m to hip up the, the whole trio sound. And he has this little, I think, I don't know, it's an octopad or something like that. And so he sampled Arnold Schwarzenegger. So we've got get into the chopper and uh, just, just stupid samples and, and he loves it. Not so sure if that was such a great idea to give him control over that because he's a very playful little child sometimes. Anyway, yeah, we're uh, yeah. using samples. It's a very powerful means to torture. <laughs> and he's very successful <laughs> so far. <laughs> so doing that. How, how did the shows, uh, how is the current tour going and how did the shows go so far? Um, all sold out, of course. <laughs> That's not true. Um, Munich was a little bit difficult. It was the 1st of May, which is a, a public uh, holiday or national holiday there. And it was rainy, blah, blah. So, but we had a, the small crowd was very nice. And we played in Linz. That was actually good. Yesterday we played in Bruck an der Leiter. Also nice today, Porgy and Bess, and then we are playing another show in uh, the Jazz Fall Moodling. Mm -hmm. So whenever I'm coming here, we try to book some shows. What about the set list? How many? W w which songs will you be playing tonight? Mostly from the last record, which is called Living the Dream, but we do have some classics, which are um, from my album Sick, and I think we play one song from the first Fat album, but. The majority of the material is actually from the last album. Talking about the last album, it was released in 2016. Uh, can you tell us uh, how you went about composing the tracks? First, I have to talk about the first Fat album first, because that will explain why the second Fat album uh, turned out to be like, like it is now. Uh, in the, the first Fat album, we had one day in the studio, and we had a couple of songs written, but that was not enough for a record. And what I usually do is I do directed jams. So I told Herbert, please play me a quiet drum solo. Uh, let's play a disco polka. So then I end up with a drum track and I compose everything around it. And sometimes I go a little bit crazy and do too many overdubs, which then makes it rather difficult performing that piece live. So the first track on the first fat record is called Disco Polka. And it is playable, but so far nobody was eager enough to really practice it. Then there's another one, The Life of Herbert P, which is just a composition about a free drum solo. That would be difficult to realize live. So, so the goal for the second record was, let's write simpler tunes that we can actually play. And, and we worked like a real band. I was here in Austria. We rehearsed and we recorded them. We actually recorded the entire album in our rehearsal room. Okay. You know, and nowadays we have to really watch the budget. Mm -hmm. And of course, I did my overdubs in LA in my studio, but 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 the drums were just recorded in the rehearsal room. And how long did it take you guys to record um, the full album? I would say technically five days, but sometimes we could only re uh, record for three hours because there were other like metal bands in the next room, and we were recording ballads, so that did not so go that well with the bleed from the other room. Uh, so I would say three days maybe. Mm -hmm. You received praise for the sound of your debut album from no, from Alan Holdsworth actually. Yeah, he came over. Um, we, we were, I have to say were, because, because he left us recently. Uh, we became friends, but a a everything happened by accident. Uh, I had a mutual friend who took me to Alan's birthday party. Of course, I wanted to go on one hand, but then I, 
I didn't ask him anything. I said, I introduced myself as, the, the friend was called Mark, I'm just Mark's designated driver. That's it. <laughs> okay. Because I didn't want to intrude on his birthday party, and, and then Mark told him who I am, that I'm a guitar player, blah, blah, blah. And then Alan was really nice. And after a while, after a couple of years, we, we became real friends and we talked a lot on the phone. He lived, back then he lived in San Diego or close to, I think between San Diego and LA. So phone was the medium and we talked a lot and then we met a couple of times and then one time he came over and stayed over, really lovely. And then that was when I finished this album and I, I played him everything. Mm -hmm. And he liked it. And he was impressed. So, was what else can I expect? Um, what, was oh. was he any influence on your playing? Oh, definitely, of course. Holzworth was. Um, I clearly remember I had a, a friend in Austria who always bought records. He had money, <laughs> so he went to the record store and, and, and bought the newest albums that were available. And one day he called me. Oh, I've got something you should listen to. And it was Alan Holzworth's uh, album Sand. And I clearly remember I was lying on, on that carpet. And listening to Sand and I just couldn't believe it because it was something that I haven't heard before and I totally did not understand what was going on and at the same time I also liked it it was very appealing to me and from that time on I became a little bit of an Alan Holdsworth detective and tried to track down everything I could which wasn't easy at that time you know pre-internet in Austria sometimes you know you had a, a friend of a friend of a friend had a cassette from some album. Later on I obviously bought everything when it was available on CD. Mm. Did you actually study the tracks or did you transcribe some? I things? transcribed some and I also had the book, it's called Reaching for the Uncommon Chord. There are some transcriptions, more of the chord stuff. I learned some of those and then I transcribed a little bit and then at a certain point I obviously stopped. Because the problem is once you learn something that you like, you will also you end up playing it, and well, there is the point in your life when you're a grown-up man and you should not play licks from other people. I'm still guilty of that, and I think everyone is guilty, but I'm a little bit more conscientious about that nowadays. <laughs> Basically, what I'm Going for is playing melodies, yeah, like when I'm playing, or motifs or riffs, and those I can make up on the spot. Sometimes, sometimes not so well, but I'm always trying. And then f with the fast stuff, then I can at least look at my cornerstones or uh, beginning, ending, where do I want to play. I, I'm trying to see the entire scale, or obviously hear the entire scale or the material on the fretboard. And I try to liberate myself from motor memory. If I will ever achieve that, I, I can't promise that. But I'm, I'm working on it. What about your chords? Uh, I, I, I was under the depression that you're using a lot of uh, chords that uh, I would traditionally associate with uh, the teachings of Mick Goodrick, for instance. Yeah, the, Mick Goodrick had one approach. Holdsworth had, like if you study Holdsworth's chord, Holdsworth's, very difficult for Austrian, uh, for German-speaking people. Holdsworth's chords. At the end of the day, everyone arrives at a, uh, or ends up at the, same, at the same result, maybe with a different method, but I never studied with Mick Goodrick. I only had that one book, The Advancing Guitarist, which I found very appealing. Uh, and then for chords, I just came up with mostly with my own concepts after a while. Of course, I did. I was a huge Joe Pass fan, and I played Joe Pass chord solos. And then I was introduced at Berkeley. I was introduced to the Drop Two system. Mick, Mick does that too. And then I found my system, which is like the 24 permutations of a seventh chord, only to find out well, other people did that before me. But I, when I found out, I was really proud because <laughs> I thought, yeah, it's mine. No, it's not mine. Other people already. Let's talk a bit about your formative years. Can you can you can you tell us uh, how you started uh, playing the guitar and what what approach you you uh, what was your approach really to to get so prolific uh, in, in harmony and technique? Um, I started as a kid. I, I took I went to a Wiener Musikschule, Viennese music school, where 
there only was classical guitar. Fortunately, I had a really good teacher, but I also really sucked at classical guitar. It just wasn't my thing. I also had no clue about practicing or no concept of that. But I basically liked the instrument and then after a while I found out, oh, I actually like some, of the, some rock music, jazz music. And I saved up for one year to finally get myself an electric guitar. My parents weren't so keen on getting me one, so I had to save all my pocket money. And I got a horrible kawaii guitar. And the music store salesman actually celebrated for once he sold it to me because they thought they would never get rid of that piece of shit. But I had it. Uh, and then there were those key elements, or uh, those key figures in my development. Uh, for instance, Joe Pass. My stepfather gave me a Joe Pass record, said, so check this out, okay? And I was really impressed, of course. Then, I, before that, I had a friend who turned me on to Deep Purple, Iron Maiden. My sister was a huge Queen fan, so I heard Queen all the time. Then, later on, somebody played me uh, Level 42, the early records, and I really liked that high-pitched snare sound, the funkiness. And then I had the friend who played me the Holdsworth records, and then I got into Schofield, Stern, Matheny, like the usual suspects. So slowly but surely I uh, got to know, was exposed to many different guitar players, and I always tried to, I don't know, understand what they were doing, and, and of course emulate it for a while. Then I had my rock phase. When I was at the conserv when I was studying at the conservatory in Vienna, I, I thought, oh, everyone is playing like Schofield, so I really should ch check out Steve Vai and Paul Gilbert. Yeah, not doing that anymore. Yeah, and then I got into Frank Zappa's music. I also, I also like that. And, and at the end, I think everyone just, just mixes their influences and, and something comes out, and that's what I'm doing now. <laughs> <laughs> 